Hey, this is Matt, and you're listening to Bluegrass Jam Along, the podcast for anyone and everyone who plays bluegrass. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Bluegrass Jam Along. Um, I've got an extra interview for you this time, and how this one came about is I recently did a couple of episodes for Doc Watson's 100th birthday, um, and if you haven't heard those, go and check them out because there's some incredible people in there. There's Brian Sutton, Tim O'Brien, um, there's T. Michael Coleman, there's Jack Lawrence, there's just like a great list of people, and one of them was John McEwen from the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, and we chatted about him working with Doc on the Wilder Circle Being Broken record, which is a really cool chat, really interesting. So go and listen to those episodes. But there was some stuff that I chatted to John about that's a bit more about his career and aspects of Wilder Circle that weren't really Doc related. And I was so kind of in need of editing that stuff down to fit everything in. Those two episodes ended up at nearly five hours as it was. But I just, I really enjoyed this chat with John. And there's so much more stuff in there that I didn't want to just leave sat on a hard drive somewhere. So I chatted uh, to John and said, look, would it be okay if I put this out as a, an episode on its own? And he very kindly said yes. So I've re-edited it and put a load of stuff back in. And I've got what I, I think is a really interesting chat with John about recording the Circle album, who they worked with, how it all came together, um, you know, how it's been received over the years and some of the stuff that he's done since as well because that was 50 years ago and John's obviously had a long musical career since then. So yeah, just a really cool chat with John McEwen, um, former member of the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Um, I really hope you enjoy it. Here we go. I mean, my, so from what I've read, my understanding is that it was you that sort of brought the bluegrass influence to the band really in the first place. The bluegrass element of the dirt band came from you. Folk music came from Jeff. Bluegrass came from me and Les. In our beginning way, at t- I was 20, Les was 16. And uh, the bluesy side came from Jimmy Fadden and kind of a rock attitude from Jimmy Ibbotson, who was from Philadelphia, so I couldn't blame him <laughs> for having that attitude. Had several attitudes. Uh, and... I would say that Les and I had the most bluegrass influence, yes, since he was mandolin and I was banjo and the other guys were just strumming away. And I didn't know it, but you familiar with his album, Uncle Charlie and his dog, Teddy? Yeah. Well, that had two bluegrass tunes on it. Les wanted to do Clinch Mountain Backstep. I did too. And, but I wanted to do Randy Lynn Rag. And, I didn't know at the time that Doc Watson was from the Clinch Mountain area, but he heard this album. Merle Watson played it for him, his son. And I didn't know Earl Scruggs would ever hear this. I hoped Randy Lynn Rag was named after his son, Randy Lynn. And <laughs> Gary Scruggs told me he was, he heard Bojangles and I had to get it. I had to go buy a copy. And he went to the store. They were sold out. So he bought the album. He listened to the record, Bojangles. Oh, good. That's it's the one. He took it home. His dad listened to, that's nice. That Bojangles song is nice. And then he played some of Shelley's Blues. Then he played Randy Lynn Rag. And, well, Earl said, let's go meet that boy that played Randy Lynn Rag the way I intend to. And, a month later, they came to our first Nashville show. That led to the friendship that six months later, I asked Earl Scruggs in Colorado, taking them back to a hotel after every night up for five nights. Earl, would you maybe would you maybe record record with the nitty gritty? And he goes, I'd be proud to. Now the next day, no, the next week. Doc Watson, oh, I called my brother and said, Earl said yes. And then I, Doc Watson was there the next week, and I asked him, I was a little braver, although I never met Doc, uh, Mr. Watson, would you like to make a record with us and uh, Nitty Gritty Dirt Band and, and Earl Scru- Scruggs? <laughs> it was kind of, uh, oh, if Earl's going to be there, I want to pick. And I had admired Doc ever since that Newport folk music album. You know, 
He was playing Dr. Yeah. Char, burning up Dr. Char. In the middle of it, he says, the sun's hot, ain't it? Or something like that. And uh, Deep River Blues and stuff. And I'd admire, admired Earl for forever. And on Monday, my brother said, I'm going to get Merle Travis. And he called Merle Travis. And uh, anyway, that's how we got Doc. And then the album, three weeks into into that process, is when we told the other guys in the dirt band, we're going to go to Nashville and make a bluegrass album. <laughs> I didn't want to. Bill and I, my brother and I, decided not to tell the guys right off because Jeff had a nickname, Doctor No. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I said, we don't want Dr. No getting upset. So when we could come to Jeff and say, Jeff, we're going to record with Earl Scruggs, Doc Watson, Earl Travis. And by then, Bill and I got Earl to ask Maybell Carter. And she said, yes, I was a huge Maybell fan. And well, she lived in the Clinch Mountains, too. So Clinch Mountain Backstep was a good thing to record. How did that happen? I don't know. But uh, then we asked him, oh, we had Jimmy Martin, too. And one of, one of the guys goes, who's Jimmy Martin? Well, you'll find out. <laughs> yeah, Jimmy Martin, the man that thought everyone has a right to his opinion. Hi, <laughs> I'm Jimmy Martin, world's best bluegrass singer. Oh, well, nice to meet you, Mr. Martin. Yeah. That was that was how he'd introduce himself. Brilliant. And so it sounds like it all came together pretty quickly then. Eight weeks after I asked Earl that question, and during the next week, Doc Watson, eight weeks after that, we started recording. And five days later, we were done. Wow. And it was six days. It actually, we did 36, 36 cuts in six days. And the book that I put out, 50 years making the landmark album, 50 years anniversary, it describes the whole thing. My brother took the photographs. He was a manager and the producer of the band and photographer. He took early, early dirt band shots and all the session shots. Well, I took one. And uh, anyway, there's a story with each photograph. And it, I've been so happy because people have emailed me and I've seen it posted. I feel like I'm at the sessions. I feel like I'm there. This really, you know, because you can read the book and see the picture. And now you can hear what is going on there. And you kind of, go, if you're playing the record, you are there. You can close your eyes. No, you got to read. It's, uh, it's really a, a neat thing. And that's one of the really cool things about the record itself is hearing the record being made as you listen to the record. There's all the studio chat and you hear the little like beautiful moments like um, Doc meeting Mel Travis, you know, and having a chat. It's all just captured because the mics are still on and people are still taping stuff. And it feels like a, a record and a documentary at the same time. Well, my brother was, he got in the music business so he could get in the film business because he couldn't just walk into the film business. He'd been to film school for a couple of years and uh, music was close. And I was in a band. Bill, would you manage my band? Oh, okay. And so he became the manager and uh, he later produced five or six Steve Martin movies. He managed Steve Martin, the comedian also. <clears throat> Steve and I went to high school together and worked in Disneyland as teenagers in the magic shop <laughs> or doing selling magic tricks. It was really fun. And fast forward for 50 years, I produced Steve's album, The Crow. And, it's a great album. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Yeah, I produced that. And we won a Grammy. Oh, boy. <clears throat> I'm glad Did you have it. Yeah, and did you did you have I mean, did you have any sense when you were recording the record that it was going to become like was it just oh we're going in the studio we're making another record with our heroes because that's what we want to do or did you have a sense that it was going to be 
what it became. The Circle album was important to me when we got the lineup, when I found out who Vassar Clements was, because I didn't know. They didn't have album credits. I asked Earl if he found fiddlers that could handle all the different styles. He goes, I found one man. I said, what's his name? Vassar Clements. Well, can he handle it all, Earl? And he just said, he'll do. (laughs) (laughs) Actually, he said it more like, he'll do. It was more, it was like so confident that you just, yes, sir. And uh, Earl got the bass player. He was playing at the Grand Ole Opry. He was, he played on everybody's records a lot. And Junior was perfect. And uh, with all those people coming through the studio, by day three, it was like, this is really more music, more songs. It went from being a double album to being a triple album. My brother's idea was to have a tape recorder running all the time at three and three quarters inches per second, you know, slower. The master tape was running at 30 inches per second. And the talking tape was running three and three quarters inches per second. <laughs> and uh, that's what caught well, that's that's what I I had to change the reels on that. But that was okay. Uh, it was a very uh, special thing. We wanted to wanted to get Doc Watson and Merle Travis meeting for the first time, you know. So we set it up to have Merle come by when Doc was recording on day three, and uh, Merle came by and starts talking. I had to interrupt. Excuse me, I got to get. Uh, uh, my brother said, "Move the mic move the, in, in the control room." You know, and I put the mic in front of Merle and uh, let them talk. And then Maybell talking. Oh, uh, Maybell was so sweet. Well, we'll do circle and uh, in whatever key suits everybody. <laughs> Look, you're Maybell Carter. Well, <laughs> we'll put in the key that suits you. Yeah. I'd like to do Wildwood Flower in the key of F, if you all don't mind. Well, uh, no, we, we don't mind, maybe. I'll hope that. Uh, <laughs> but that's just the way, that's the way she was. And uh, Jimmy Martin. <laughs> I, I start off that first song. The sequencing was very important on this album. My brother did all this besides producing. He sequenced it. It took three months. It was days of razor blades, you know? Yeah. Editing and putting in all those little snippets of the talk and moving them around. You couldn't just do, like, you know, a Photoshop or Pro Tools stuff. You had to cut a piece of tape and go, okay, this is the one copy of them talking goes here. And then it, it was just really... So the first song, I, I messed up the beginning, and Jimmy Martin goes, "Earl never did do that." <laughs> you know, it was <laughs> you got all uh, got all those licks in your head, don't you? Ain't you? And uh, anyway, it was really a, a great way to start an album with a mistake. <laughs> was it was it intimidating for you having all those people in the room? Jimmy Martin, I felt intimidated. He'd had some of the best banjo players that ever picked. J.D. Crow, who I hadn't met yet, and uh, Alan Mundy and some other people. And, well, Alan Mundy, Alan hadn't played with him yet. But <clears throat> just monster players. These guys, mm-hmm. J.D. passed away last year. <clears throat> but um, But Jimmy was great. And After finding out on day two, we found out that they are all big fans of each other. Maybell, oh, Roy, I'm so glad we're in the studio together. Well, Maybell, it's about time we made a recording together, you know, and Doc Watson, I've always wanted to meet you, Merle, Travis, and he was wanted to record with you. And, and uh, they wanted, he wanted to record with him. So, it was like 
we brought a bunch of friends together so they could talk. How did they talk? They used music. And we joined the conversation sometimes. It was really, uh, it got less intimidating. As by song number six, I think, or seven, it was like, okay, we're the band. Let's go. Let's finish. Let's do so-and-so, you know? And it sort of feels like, you know, talking from this point in time, 50 years on now, there's so, you see so many collaborations between artists of different generations and it's so it's a, it's a commonplace thing for people to play with their heroes, but it feels like that was a pretty new thing at the time. The, a sort of multi-generational thing like that. Well, yeah, it hadn't been done multi-generational. It was three, three generations. It was, uh, Randy Scruggs was 17. Uh, I was 20, 24, uh, 25. And uh, the guys were younger. They've always been younger than me. How? <laughs> but uh, Earl was, I'm now 30 years older than Earl was when he did the records. Wow. <laughs> but uh, anyway, Earl was the next generation. And then actually a generation above him was Roy Acuff and Maybell Carter, kind of. Acuff, I think, was really old. He was like 64. <laughs> I remember 64. Mm-hmm. Oh, I think. <laughs> yeah, and it's an amazing thing. And did it feel like, obviously, there was like a generational gap there as well. Did it feel like there was any sort of cultural gap or did it just feel like the music tied everything together really instantly? I think everybody was so concerned about the music. They didn't worry about politics. No, it wasn't it. They just didn't worry about politics. I mean, the country was outside the studio. The Vietnam war was raging. And it was getting worse. And it was 1971. And and the uh, churches have been burned and kids and people being killed. And the, the Robert Kennedy was freshly dead. And, you know, all kinds of things were going on to make America really divided, kind of like it is now in some ways, but differently. And... It was like a, a breath of fresh air that none of that existed. Roy Acuff was a Republican. You know, he was a real staunch Republican. He ran for governor once, but didn't hear a peep out of him in regards to anything but music. Same with Doc Watson. And Earl, Earl, who'd been to the to Washington, D.C. and on one, one of the demonstrations, let's see, was it? I think 69 or 70, he was at one of the peace rallies. And that got him some flack from some of the Opry people, but they, they let it go. I mean, it, it blew over. And nothing came up but the tunes. And that was great. And it's really cool to hear that, um, what you were just saying about, about all the, those players coming together and like you you're listening back across history, I presume they all knew each other and they'd all cross paths at some point, but the idea that like they enjoyed the sessions as much as you guys did, because they were getting to make music together. And that's a, that's a lovely thing to hear. Well, some of them knew each other, like Earl knew junior Husky, but he'd, he'd never really played with them. Junior was at the Opry all the time. So he'd see him there. Um, he'd, Maybell was at the Opry and Acuff and, and Bashful Brother Oswald. But he, Oswald never played with the other people, you know? He mm. might have played with them, he didn't record with them. And they kind of knew each other. They, they were in the same business, you know? Uh, Doc and Merle hadn't met, but that was a, a wonderful thing. Uh, we got to hang out yeah and it's sort of 
sort of mind boggling thinking about that only being five or six days when you think about the wealth of music that's on there and how how it's endured and what a sort of cornerstone of American acoustic music that record is. The idea that it was, you know, less than a week in the making. Yeah, I've been I've been reliving that week for fifty years. <laughs> That's why I had to write the book. And <laughs> it's uh, every photo, one hundred and forty-eight of them, in the book has a story behind them, and I'm really glad of that because it takes people there. It makes them realize if you don't have the album and you get it and read this book, you'll go, "Wow." That was cool, you know. It's it's not like uh, it's not like anything else. I don't think. And to people in America, the Circle album is kind of like. Have you heard the book? Heard of the book Chicken Soup for the Soul? Mm, yeah. It's like a musical version of Chicken Soup for the Soul. It's like a. Yeah, when I first heard the Circle album, I was in Vietnam, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, when I first heard the Circle album, I, my father had kicked me out of the house. Well, he came back, and I was playing this record in my bedroom, and he stuck his head in and said, what are you listening to? And I told him, and he goes, that's my music. And my, and my father, we started talking then. He listened to the whole record. You know, it, it brought people together, and it... Uh, it, it just did that over. I've heard that story at least five times from five different people. You know, the one about the father sticking his head in the bedroom and the kids listening to the record. Mm. People still listen to that I, I, after 50 years. I listen to it sometimes. It's really, it's like watching an old TV show that you haven't seen for a while. And you, oh, I remember that part. I don't know what it is, but it's very strange to go back in time and back in that safe space of will the circle be unbroken. And what um, what are your memories of Doc at those sessions? When we were recording Tennessee Stud, that was one that my brother really wanted to get with Doc because he just has a perfect voice. And I'm sitting with my headphones on, plunking on the banjo, along about 1825, and about the end of the first verse, I went, I'm playing on an old record. This is 1938. This is 1935. This guy is real. Doc Watson was real. He was really what so many people have emulated. And even me, I play Doc's guitar, a finger pick, and, uh, you know, little, 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 but, he really played it. But his Tennessee stud, that really captured a, a moment. That was that was done, one take, and he did it perfect. I think I think we everybody else performed right too, but it sounds so captivating. I'm sitting there with the headphones on, listening. I'm not Oh, I'm playing on this record. I better pay attention. You know, it was really wonderful. Way downtown, a frail in the banjo, you know, and that was easy as pie because Doc was driving it. He had a, a rhythm. He had a spirit. He was like Levon Helm was with the drums. Levon Helm of the band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when Levon was playing in the group, sitting in with somebody or whatever, everybody was happy because he had a way of playing. Just a, uh, I, he called me to play the 70th birthday party in Woodstock, and I took my wife, and she wasn't a band fan. She never didn't really pay attention. And the only place to stand after I did my set and watch him was like three feet away from his drums. You know, like really close. I, right. By the by, the third song, I said, "Honey, we can move to the back of the room." I think she goes, "No, this is fine. This guy's great." You know, because he was quiet and he was like singing so good, and 
that's what Doc was like. Doc was, Doc was uh, just really uh, his spirit of way what we, his spirit of way what he was doing came through his notes, his precise chuck and chuck and chuck, and man, and his voice, <laughs> it was. It was one of the best feelings in the world. I sat in with Doc a couple dozen times over the years and uh, pick that banjo, John. You know, it was like when I take my solo to see him go, ha, ha, you know, at the end. Yeah, that's it. You know, you, uh, the approval, the approval that would give you, the uh, feeling that I want to be in this club. Oh, I'm in it. I meant it. I joined for a brief moment. I rarely got that feeling with the group I was in, but I did sometimes. It was a different thing. But playing with Doc was wonderful. I uh, I got to give him a gold record on stage one time. That was fun. Yeah, he says, "Yeah, I've, I've been, I've had to play that Tennessee stud almost every show thanks to that album." And he was not exactly thrilled about that, but <laughs> you know, he liked doing other songs, but he had a hit. Yeah, and I you sort of get a sense that um from the things I've read that Doc was like really happy with the way the album came out and it, you know, no doubt brought him to a whole new audience of people as well. When I went to see him at that club in Boulder, Merle said, yeah, this, this folk music thing is dying out. Because Doc, had, a few years before, was playing to pretty big crowds because of he was on Hootenanny show, he was on records, the folk thing was happening, but the folk scare was over. And uh, <laughs> it was kind of dying out. And I had people, I was doing a song where we, I would flat pick. We were doing Way Downtown. And people, wow, I've never heard anybody play acoustic guitar like that. Well, you know, you've heard of Doc Watson, haven't you? No, who's that? Had so many people asking about who is Doc Watson. I wanted to get him out to more people. And the Dirt Band was playing colleges everywhere. And, well, that just seemed like a natural marriage. Same thing, same thing with Earl Scruggs. Where'd you learn to play the banjo like that? You ever heard of Earl Scruggs? No. You know, 1970, 71, 69, like that. So getting Doc in front of a bunch of new people was wonderful. And you get the feeling that, you know, this this 100th anniversary of his birthday will do that in some form again as well, particularly with people like Billy Strings, you know, out there shouting about Doc Watson and bringing a whole bunch of new people in that Doc's 100th birthday is an opportunity for a whole new generation to hear Doc Watson and be amazed. Yeah, I think Billy Strings is going to do a lot of good for the acoustic guitar. He is fantastic, isn't he? Absolutely. He's playing a, a hall here in Nashville. He's playing a, the Bridgestone Arena. 18,000 people sold out three shows. A guy with an acoustic guitar. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they toured here last year, and they're not, you know, bluegrass is a, is less of a thing in the UK than it obviously is in the States. And I got to see him in a record store in front of 350 people, and that's never going to happen again. <laughs> well, it is the first thing I heard when I started playing the banjo. Bluegrass is going to be big this year. They said that for a few years, and it didn't change at all. Doolin Banjos came on the radio in the 60s. Bluegrass is going to be big this year. Every radio station was playing Doolin Banjos. Nothing happened. Then Bonnie and Clyde came out with Foggy Mountain Breakdown. Bluegrass is going to be big this year. Nothing. And, you know, it was just then Misty, uh, Stevens, Ray Stevens' song, Misty, with banjo on it. And counting flowers on the wall with banjo on it. Bluegrass is going to, you know, it's like. <laughs> but finally, the Circle album, 
seemed to seemed to open some doors. It started yeah. getting play, and other people that were ready and waiting had a, more of an audience. And it it kind of went up very slow to where years go by and it's still going up. <laughs> you know, Allison Krauss comes along and uh, anyway, it's it's going to be big this year. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and it's just great sort of thinking back, talking about an album that was, you know, recorded 50 years ago that people are still coming to now and people will still be coming to for years and finding it for themselves and like that would be the key that unlocks this whole world to them. Thank you. I appreciate that. It's a part of what, part of what I do. And, uh, I've made a bunch of my solo albums that I think are excellent. One of them called string wizards is my answer to the circle album. It's an instrumental album. And I made it with, um, Sam Bush, Jerry Douglas, Stuart Duncan, David Greer, Roy Husky, and me, and some of my best banjo playing. It's really a, an interesting album. Oh, and Earl Scruggs plays on a couple songs, too. And uh, we did one of his tunes. Where I frailed the banjo, and he picked it, you know? Yeah. And, and the bass player that played on Soldier's Joy... Junior Husky, his son played on Carolina Traveler on String Wizards. So we had the same bass. I played the same banjo I played on Soldier's Joy on the Circle album, Uncle Dave Macon's old banjo, and Earl picked whatever he had. And uh, that's one of my favorite recordings, Carolina Traveler. Three instruments. And two of them are banjos. <laughs> I've really, I've really been proud that that uh, Allison Krauss, you know that name? Yeah, yeah. Or Allison Brown, you know that name? Yeah. That they both told me that Soldier's Joy was a big influence on them. Several people have told me Soldier's Joy was the door opening thing for them. So Carolina Traveler was good. <laughs> I, I play, You know what the IBMA is, I guess? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I played with Earl one night opening one of, one of the segments of the IBMA show. And we rehearsed Carolina Traveler 15 times with Tom Gray from, I called up Tom, Tom, have you ever played with Earl? You haven't? You want to? Okay, good. You know, anybody would want to play with Earl, but I needed a bass player and I needed, I wanted to play with Tom Gray. And we must have rehearsed it 15 times. We go out in front of the audience Start. He's and he starts off. He plays "Home Sweet Home" instead. <laughs> At the end, he goes. Oh, he goes. That was the wrong tune. <laughs> That's another, it's okay. We know that one too. And his wife was sitting in the audience, and and somebody sitting with her said, "Louise turned to me on the fourth note and said, That's the wrong tune.'" <laughs> but. Was okay. Cool. I hope you enjoyed that. Um, if you did, don't forget to go back and check out the two episodes that I did on Doc. I will put links in the show notes, and there's also going to be links in the show notes to John's site and his social media and various other bits we talked about there. So do go and check those out as well. Um, I'll be back next week with another Bluegrass Briefing and another episode for you. In the meantime, have a great week and happy picking.